And here it is, the fifth saying of Christ from the cross, and it is the shortest of the seven sayings. It's the shortest, but perhaps it's the one that we can relate to the most. Jesus says two words, I thirst. Now we can't fathom relating to anything that Jesus is experiencing on that Good Friday where he is laying down his life so that we might live. There is so much cosmic, supernatural, spiritual transaction and power in this moment. We can't fathom it, but to a certain degree, of course we know what it's like to be thirsty. To a certain degree, on a daily basis, we know what it's like to have thirst. God has designed us to crave water, designed us to need hydration, designed us that we would have to continually come back to the well to find what we need to survive and to be satisfied. All of us can relate to being thirsty. Yet I would submit to you that our physical thirst isn't the only thing that is thirsty about us. That there is more to us than just the desire for water. No, we have a deeper thirst and a deeper appetite. And that's why earlier in the Gospel of John, John chapter 4, John tells a story of a Samaritan woman and two wells. A Samaritan woman and two wells. A Samaritan woman who, yes, had a checkered past, and her people were considered half-breeds by the Jews. They were less than the Gentiles. And here she was in the middle of the day when no one went to go get water, Because not only does she have a checkered past, she's also, because of her mistakes, a social outcast. But there's Jesus at the well. It's Jacob's well. What this woman didn't understand in that moment was that she was going to Jacob's well, but what she needed was Jesus as well. Jesus asked her to go get her husband. And then it's revealed that she has had five husbands. And currently the man she's with is not her husband. This woman knows what it's like to be thirsty. She knows the quench. She she knows the desire that needs to be quenched, not just at this well, but she keeps going from what? Relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship. And it would be this relationship. That would be the most important one. Jesus says this in John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, everyone who drinks of this water from Jacob's well will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You see, there was two wells on that day. And there was a deeper thirst that she didn't even know that she had. And Jesus was the one who could truly satisfy it. Here at the cross, when Jesus says those two words, I thirst, he's not the only person that is thirsty on that day. He's not the only person that's thirsty leading up to the cross. Herod, the one who betrayed Jesus, was thirsty for money. Herod, one of the ones who condemned Jesus, was thirsty for power. Pilate, the governor of that area, he was thirsty to appease the crowds. The angry mob was thirsty for blood. The religious leaders were thirsty for vengeance. Every one of us is thirsty for something that water knows not of. Many people that get addicted to alcohol, it's not just the drink that they're trying to assuage. It's not just the parched throat that they're trying to satisfy. No, the reason why we become addicted to these different kinds of drinks is because it's fulfilling or trying to fill a need deeper in us. Now, whether it's alcohol or let's be honest, whether we're thirsty for money, whether we're thirsty for power, 
whether we're thirsty for pleasure, have you noticed that everything in this parched land promises to satisfy and never does? Everything promises to, what does the advertisement say? What does Gatorade say? Quench your thirst. Sprite says, obey your thirst. Jesus would say, I am what you're thirsty for. You understand how Christianity is different, right? Christianity isn't about finding what we're truly desiring in a program or finally finding our sustenance and satisfaction in a pilgrimage. No, it all and always comes down to a person, and his name is Jesus. So the question is, church, each individual here, what well are we continually coming back to? What well do we look to to fill us up, to give us life, to give us satisfaction? Because, by the way, each one of us, including myself, is constantly going to some well. What well do you naturally long for? What well do you wake up thinking about? What well, when you're by yourself, do you naturally gravitate to? And then, yes, this might be the biggest indicator if one of these wells dries up. If one of these wells in your life, whatever it may be, whether it's career, whether it's popularity, whether it's perfect health, whether it's being liked, when that well dries up, who are you? How do you look at yourself? Do you still have hope in the world? Is your very identity rocked and ravaged to the core? We might say, yeah, well, my well is Jesus. But when those other wells that we tend to look for satisfaction in dry up, then it comes to the surface that no, in actuality, we've been looking for other things to satisfy our thirst. John chapter 4 isn't the only time Jesus would make this audacious claim. In fact, just a couple chapters later, John 6, verse 35, Jesus says this, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. It's two times. Believe it or not, he's going to say it again. In the next chapter, John chapter 7, he says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus also, one day, oh, I want you to hear this, one day comes back for his church. He comes back for his people. He comes back to restore justice and righteousness forever. He comes back to finally bring his kingdom in all of its glory. He comes back to wipe away every single tear and listen, you're not going to believe it. At the end of your Bible, he comes back to quench every single thirst. This is from Revelation chapter 21. Hear the word of the Lord. And he who is seated on the throne, Jesus said, behold, I am making all things new. He said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus says to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. So whether it was then, 2,000 years ago, or whether when he returns, the need to have this thirst quenched will not go away. And the promise that only one can finally and ultimately quench it will always be the case. So let's return to the cross, shall we? And let's hear the fifth of Jesus's seven sayings and then ask ourselves, even as we study these two very short verses, what am I thirsty for? And do I need to wake up to the fact that the thing that I've been turning to The well that I've been pulling from 
has not satisfied. And then, yes, maybe like an anvil on our misplaced hope destroys any kind of ideology that says we'll find satisfaction in anyone but the one who's about to say, I thirst. Let's look at the text. John chapter 19, verse 28. 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. Isn't your Bible remarkable? Hopefully in this verse and in the next, you will be filled with so much confidence in the prophetic precision of your Bible that you will also be able to trust that when Jesus says, come to me, all who are thirsty, that he actually will quench that thirst. Confidence, confidence and assurance in God's word because before Jesus said, I thirst, it was connected to an Old Testament passage. It was connected to several different Old Testament passages, probably more specifically in Psalm 69, verse 3 and 21. The psalmist cries out, I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. For my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Psalm 22 also talks about how the Messiah would be parched and that his tongue would dry up in his mouth. You see how God has so intricately prophesied six to seven to eight to thousands of years before Easter exactly what would happen. I'm going to read some examples. It's not exhaustive, but it should be enough for us to truly be in awe of what the Bible says so quickly that God is handling so accurately. What do I mean by that? For example, you could turn to Psalm 41 verse 9 and you could read about how the Messiah would be betrayed by a familiar friend. You could turn to Psalm 31 and you could read about how the Messiah would be forsaken by the disciples who were offended by him. You could read in Psalm 35 verse 11 that there would be false accusations against the Messiah. You could read in Isaiah 53 verse 7 the silence of the Messiah before the judges. Isaiah 53 9 the Messiah being proven guiltless before his judges. Isaiah 53, 12, the Messiah being numbered among the transgressors. Should I go on? I'm going to take that as a yes. Psalm 22, verse 16, literally prophesies his hands and his feet being pierced. Psalm 109, 25, prophesies the Messiah's mockery among the spectators. Psalm 22, 18, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, if not last week, that the Bible prophesies that there would be gambling over his garments. What do you do with that? That's remarkable. And then it continues. In Isaiah 53, verse 12, it prophesies the Messiah interceding for transgressors while suffering. Isaiah, I'm sorry, Psalm 22, verse 1, prophesies the Messiah being forsaken by God. Psalm 31 verse 5 prophesies Jesus yielding his spirit into the hands of his father. And then, yes, Psalm 34 verse 20 prophesies that none of Jesus' bones will be broken. And then Isaiah 53 9, that Jesus' burial will be by a rich man. Wow, that's a lot to take in. And I know what it's like. I know what it's like to sit in the pew. I do. That's very interesting, Pastor. Can't wait to tell some of my uh, non-Christian buddies at work. When does this matter? It always matters, by the way. When does the reality of its consequences come crashing down on us? When we need to know if this is true. When we're desperate and thirsty. In this day and age, in the United States of America, this great country and land that we live in, many of us are blessed to have this at any time. A bottle of water, clean, healthy, accessible. But around the world, this, which we take so easily for granted, it comes literally out of our spigots in our kitchens and our bathrooms. This is a matter of life and death. This is a desperate need. Listen to this statistic. 
Tens of thousands of people die every year of thirst, water deprivation, or waterborne diseases. According to the World Health Organization, every 15 seconds, should I pause for 15 seconds? Every 15 seconds, a child dies from a preventable disease associated with the lack of clean water. It's remarkable. We don't know how good we got it. We really don't. But here's what's interesting, is that even though we have this, we have bottled water, we have tap water, we have all kinds of water, we still, I would submit to you, live in a land that's spiritually parched, spiritually a desert wasteland, like this picture behind me. Because everyone keeps going back to their old systems, their old ways, and as Jeremiah says it, broken cisterns. Centuries before Jesus came and said, I am the wellspring of life, Jeremiah said this, it's the Lord speaking through him, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Still, to this day, both believing and unbelieving tend to return back to this cracked parched desert wasteland and those bitter broken cisterns to find water to find drink why why is the bible's accuracy of prophecy so important because when you're thirsty listen you're desperate we're not desperate for h2o but we are desperate for father son and spirit we are desperate for salvation we are desperate for satisfaction. We need to know, and that's why the Bible is so clear about this being the fulfillment of Scripture. We need to know that when Jesus says, I can quench your thirst, he's not just saying something esoteric, abstract, and philosophical. No, he means it. So why? Why do I keep going back to the broken cisterns? Why do we? Why do marriages over and over again struggle? Because they're dried up of love. Parents dried up of patience for their kids. People entertaining awful, ghastly thoughts of ending their life because they're dried up of hope. How can that happen? Oh, because there's a thirst deeper than any water can satisfy. The next verse in verse 29 talks about how they try to satisfy Jesus' thirst. And as you saw, it's a fulfillment of Scripture. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a, what is the word? Hyssop branch. I want you to underline that, circle that, star that, because it's significant. And then they held it to his mouth. So not only was Jesus thirsty to fulfill Scripture, but we also see here that the way that they tried to satisfy Jesus' thirst was through a hyssop branch. I want you to think about what's going on, not only in Jesus' body, but yes, in Jesus' person, okay? Jesus is slowly dying from loss of blood. Believe it or not, though, it won't be the crown of thorns that kills him. It won't be the uh, nails through his hands and his feet that finally kill him. It'll be asphyxiation. And leading up to asphyxiation is intense dehydration. So Jesus' body is on fire. But I would submit to you, as we talked about last week, that what is really the most painful in this moment is that Jesus is taking the darkness of our sin, the one who was the light of the world, now taking our darkness so much that God, as he did with Egypt before the Passover, shrouds the entire city of Jerusalem in utter, complete darkness. The father has to turn his back on his son because his son has become sin. The father cannot have fellowship with sin. In fact, this is why the father has given his son so that through his son, we could have fellowship with the father. Track that? If we were to approach God in all of his perfect holiness, we wouldn't be able to have fellowship with him. We wouldn't be able to enter into his perfect presence. And by the way, what is heaven? It's wherever God is. 
It's not just where we want to see our relatives and our lost loved ones. No, it's where God is. And if God is altogether holy, we needed purification. So in the Old Testament, before the Passover, they were instructed, the people of God, Israel, were instructed to sacrifice a lamb, to spread the blood of the lamb over their doorposts, and then to use a hyssop branch. Isn't that remarkable? Isn't your Bible cool? Now here it is, where you have the Passover lamb, the lamb who was given for the sins of the world, Jesus Christ. So we don't celebrate the Passover anymore because the Passover has been passed over once and for all. You're about to hear three very, very important words from Jesus, but we're going to get to that. They used a hyssop branch to cover the doorposts with the, the blood of the lamb. And now here it is, Jesus is sacrificing, is giving his blood so the wrath of God, the justice of God would pass over us. And sure enough, what are they using? Hyssop. Remarkable. And not by accident. When King David, yes, we know King David as the little shepherd boy that took down the giant. We know King David because he was a songwriter and he wrote Psalm 23, probably the most beloved passage in all the Bible. But did you know that uh, King David was also an adulterer and he had someone murdered? In his confession in Psalm 51, you can read about what the anatomy of repentance really looks like, but one of the verses is so beautiful, but yet we have a hard time understanding what it really looks like it means because he says, Lord, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Hyssop was directly connected with purification. Purification over a house that was filled with disease. Purification of uncleanliness. Here is a hyssop branch given to Jesus so that he would have the ability to say the next three words. Do you know what's about to come? Oh, you got to come back next Sunday. <laughs> we'll give you a little heads up. Part of the reason Jesus needed a drink was not only to fulfill scripture, not only to use the analogy of the hyssop branch, not only because in his substitution for our sin, he's feeling the darkness of sin, the need for sin, but also so that he would take a drink so he could proclaim it is finished. What's finished? As it pertains to thirst, our cycle of Sin, our cycle of thirst, our cycle of going to broken cisterns, our cycle of going to counterfeit saviors, our cycle of looking for life, love, and purpose in a parched land, finished. There's a reason these go together. Literally, I mean, I feel like I should read the next line because they're so close together. So do you think it's finished? Do you believe it's finished? If you do, then it's time to stop going back to the broken cisterns. It's time to choose your will. It's time to look not to the things of this world to satisfy, but to look to the one who has overcome the world. Can you think about this with a mo for a moment with me? Jesus, God the Son and the Son of God, always in perfect unity with the Father. Listen, this is so important. I want you to hear this. Never in any moment in all created time from eternity past did Father, Son, and Spirit know the effects of sin. They didn't even know a taste of it. They didn't even know an atom of it. They had no understanding of what sin was and what sin felt like. Now, we do. Oh, we know what sin feels like, right? When we do it, literally, there's something about it we feel unclean. There's something about it where we stop trusting our loved ones. There's something about it where we go into a dark place of guilt and depression. There's something about it where, yeah, we used to believe in God, but now we're not sure he exists anymore. Oh, man, that's a dark place. Jesus never, ever, ever knew that until now. And he has all of it, all of ours, every mistake, 
the sin of commission, the sin of omission, the sins of our hands and the sins of our hearts, not only the things that we say, but the things that we think. He's feeling the darkness and the desperation of that thirst. And he still says, it is finished. Some of us, this really comes down to belief. We really, really don't believe this. We don't. Because if we did, then out of our belief would come a change of behavior. Out of our attitude would come a change of action. Because Jesus said, it is finished, we should know it. In the bottom, in the core of our being, that that's not going to lead to life. That that's not going to lead to hope. That that's not ultimately going to satisfy. Jesus knew how dark our sin was. Listen, he knows everything that we've ever done and he loves us more than anyone else. He knows how dark it is. He knows how desperate it is. He knows that that thirst is always at the tip of our tongues, always scratching underneath the surface, always gnawing at us and always, yes, threatening to destroy our lives and our relationships. He knows it and he still says it is finished. Do you believe the cross quenches your deepest needs? Take this as a moment to redirect, to realign, and to choose the right well. To go to not what the world says will satisfy, but what Jesus promises has, can, and will forever and ever. Hallelujah and amen. Let's pray.